fifty seven. Um, yes. uh, there we go, James. You're the host now. Fifty seven participants. Is it um, YouTube already? Right. So uh, good evening everybody. Uh it's uh a rather tricky evening, it's rather cold out there, so I hope you're all sort of warm and about to enjoy uh, uh, some of the delightful pictures of, uh, of bucolic uh, uh, Lincolnshire. Um, this go. is particularly uh, a welcome opportunity that uh, some of us have felt rather guilty that our good friend, colleague, uh, respected expert on the Lower Cretaceous, uh, Paul Hildreth, uh, was unable to present his second presidential address uh, due to the COVID restrictions. Uh, we've attempted once or twice subsequently to uh, try and get it up and running. And at last, uh, I'm delighted to be able to invite Paul to give us, present this to us. Uh, I'm sure it's, uh, well, many of us, I've been fortunate enough to share some of the field work with him, uh, at least the visits that he, he's made. Um, so uh, this is going to be exciting. And I don't think he's understating uh, the fact of this being a jewel in the geological crown of Lincolnshire. Um, so I think at this point, before we go straight into Paul, I think... Uh, it, it, is it James who can give us some housekeeping on this now? Uh, James, are you able to do the housekeeping in terms of who raises hands, puts questions? That's fine. I don't think the housekeeping slides have been added, so let me just load it up. Um, bear one second. If you can bear with us, Paul, just uh, yeah. make sure all the attendees are... Uh, um, yeah, that's fine. Friends. Do you need me to do you need me to stop sharing my screen though? I, I just need to get get it up. So just give me one second. Um, I'll, I'll change the screen over when it's up. Okay. Please be patient, everybody. This is just a little bit of housekeeping uh, to make the the flow of the event work. Effectively. Apologies about this. Bear me one second. Perhaps, Paul, if you'd like to give a brief introduction to your talk once I get the housekeeping slides up, if that's okay. Yes, please. Yep, you can do that. is the point that if it was it's not a, allowing uh, to um, upload at the moment so i'm just going to read the mouth if that's okay with everyone okay please do Thanks, so please uh, do listen Jack. in everybody um if you can't hear any sound please do check your speakers are connected and switched on and that the volume is adjusted to a comfortable level um please let us know if you can't see the slide as well just notify us in the chat um participants must be muted and invisible to other participants by default um the controls menu is a pop-up from the foot of the screen on a PC or Mac, or drop down from the top of the screen on a tablet or mobile device. If you have any problems, use the chat feature and send a message to one of the hosts. We will be using a Q&A feature to take questions. Use the button in the menu bar at the bottom of the screen. You can type in a question anytime during the webinar. You will then be unmuted and invited to ask a question in person after the speakers finish their presentation. If problems persist during the meeting, please exit the Zoom application and open it back up and rejoin the webinar. You can also watch this webinar live on YouTube where recording will be made available for a period of time afterwards. Thank you for listening, everybody. I'll pass you on to Paul Hildreth. Okay, thanks, James. And thanks, everyone. And thanks, John, for the introduction. 
Uh, and as John said, this is hopefully third time lucky. Um, tonight's talk, as John said, was originally planned for December 2020 as my second presidential address. And then it was rearranged for delivery in Scunthorpe in the summer of 2021. Uh, in both cases, the restrictions imposed because of the COVID epidemic ruined our plans. Though the outdoor meeting accompanying the second event did go ahead and it was well attended. And this uh, opening photograph is the area that we visited on that field trip. Uh, tonight's talk on the early Cretaceous rocks uh, will reflect the main thrust of my professional career, uh, that of an educator. So I hope to give you an awareness of not only the geology of Lincolnshire, but also an appreciation of the county itself. Just before I do um, start, though, I'd like to dedicate the talk, as I would have done uh, in its original form, to a former colleague of mine, Malcolm Fry. Uh, some of the longer standing members of council may remember that Malcolm was very briefly on council, just prior to him being diagnosed with cancer. And unfortunately, he died shortly afterwards. Um, Malcolm and I worked together after our retirements uh, working for the Lincolnshire Geosites Group, uh, surveying and producing reports on listed geosites. Uh, several of these were lower Cretaceous sites and thus of great interest to both of us. Um, as you will learn during the talk, we both lived in a part of the county, the county of Lincolnshire, that has very attenuated lower Cretaceous stratigraphy. And in fact, none of the beds that are the focus of tonight's talk actually occur in the area in which we live. Uh, following a good educational practice, I'm going to start with aims and objectives. Uh, firstly, the aim. The aim is to uh, raise awareness of the geology and geomorphology of Lincolnshire uh, and study uh, uh, what is probably the county's most interesting yet much overlooked sequence. And to do that, or achieve that, oh, that's, a, by the way, the ringed area is just uh, a highlighting, if you can see it, Right in the centre of the uh, circle is Lincoln Cathedral, sitting on its uh, uh, middle Jurassic limestone ridge. So we're looking um, looking west from the eastern side of Lincolnshire across to Lincoln, across the Ancombe Valley. Paul, I can only I can't see the presentation. I can see your first slide only. Oh yes, I'm not sure. We're seeing. Uh... I think we're seeing your screen, Paul, but not seeing the presentation full, oh, full screen. Okay. So all you can see then is the picture over over the Claxby. I, I the can Claxby see. Over. We're going to see yes. the first one. I think you talk about the third one. It doesn't seem to be paused or anything. Um, let me see. If I... You should be seeing a picture of Malcolm Fry now. No. No, I'm still seeing the first slide, the oh. Lower Cretaceous East Lindsay group. Okay. So I've, I've gone on to, okay, I wonder what's happened. Are you, on, are, you on, are you on presentation mode on PowerPoint? I would have thought so. Yeah, just hold that. Let me, uh, let me just stop sharing for a second. I'll start sharing again. You should have the first slide. Oh, it's loading now. Sorry. <clears throat> It's taking a while to load. Yeah, it looks you know, like it's okay. Time. This looks okay, Paul. But try, try moving this to the third Let slide. Let me just now. try. Picture of Malcolm. Mm, yes. 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 Go yes. Good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
Well, that's, that's Malcolm, who was a former colleague, as I said earlier, and very briefly a member of council. Um, and this is where I was going on about the aims and objectives and so on. So uh, mm -hmm. here we have... Sorry, that shouldn't be there. Well, we get rid of that. There we go. Sorry. Yes, so the aim is to raise awareness of the uh, geology and geomorphology of Lincolnshire through a study of what's probably the county's most interesting yet much overlooked sequence. And um, the ring there that I mentioned in the centre of the ring, where the pointer is, you can see Lincoln Cathedral standing on the Middle Jurassic Lincolnshire Limestone Ridge, separated from the um, western side of the um, Lincolnshire Wolds by the Ancombe Valley. So the objectives for tonight are several. Uh, to find the limits of the study, uh, both in time and space, uh, to outline the stratigraphy of this East Lindsay group, it's a name that I've coined. Uh, I know the purists will probably uh, take me to task on this, but it's a, it's a name that I've coined for the purposes of this talk, hence the uh, inverted commas. Uh, to raise awareness of the East Lindsay group rocks and landscape, to raise awareness of the East Lindsay group rocks in the local economy and folk culture, to give an overview of the other coeval UK sequences, and to reconstruct the early Cretaceous paleogeography of Lincolnshire. And just during the talk to highlight any issues yet to be resolved. So there's a lot to get through tonight. So I'm sorry about the delay on starting. So defining the limits of the study, basically in sp space on the left, um, the outcrop of the early Cretaceous rocks is shown in dark green. And as you can see from the map here, as you move towards the north of the county, they disappear. And Malcolm and I um, lived in the north of the county, just to the uh, west of Grimsby. Um, so in our area, these low Cretaceous rocks don't occur, or, or very, very thin uh, occurrence, and certainly not of the East Lindsay group that uh, are going to feature tonight. Now, on the right, I've got uh, just bracketed the time in which we're going to look at. Uh, so um, we're looking there at the bracketed period of time from the Tithonian, uh, last parts of the Tithonian up to the Aptian and everything in between. Um, and so the, um, yeah, this is not uh, poor draftsmanship. It's, uh, it does overlap into the upper part of the Jurassic. It's not uh, that the uh, bracket is poorly placed. Um, so this is the age then of the uh, East Lindsay group, uh, starting with the Periacean and then through up to the, the Aptian. The Albion is not part of this East Lindsay group that I'm describing today. So we're looking at the, the beds below the marine transgression uh, at the base of the Carstone. So we're looking at basal beds containing a late Jurassic fauna um, rather like the Purbeck beds of southern England, um, straddling the Jurassic Cretaceous boundary. So we're looking at the beds below this Carstone and Red Chalk transgression, which does actually uh, uh, stretch into the northern parts of Lincolnshire. Uh, but the beds below, the ages below there, the stages below, do not. And we have to include a little bit of the Upper Jurassic, Late Jurassic, part of the Tithonian in part. So that's our time range of this East Lindsay group. Putting it all together and con uh, comparing with other parts of the country, our East Lindsay group occupies that central uh, bright or, uh, bright yellow orange uh, block um, and you'll see that uh, above that they've got the red chalk cast stone transgression below it the Kimmeridge clay if we move northwards towards Yorkshire 
the coeval beds are the speet and clay, very well known, many, um, the speet and clay. If we move southwards, you'll see that the higher parts are the lower green sand that come in in Cambridgeshire and parts, parts of Norfolk. And even further south, we get the Wealden beds and upper Purbeck beds uh, of the southeast England, southern England and the Isle of, Isle of Wight. So he, this is putting the Lindsay group in its context uh, geographically uh, and time-wise as well on the same diagram. And you can just see that the base of this East Lindsay group is just into the top of the Tithonian, uh, the later part of the Jurassic. <clears throat> the um, beds uh, occur in a basin between the Market Wheaton High in the north and the East Anglian Massif in the south. Um, it's probably open to the sea northeastwards with ephemeral links to the southwest. And we'll see more of that a little bit later on in later slides. Uh, note also the fasces changes not only between North Norfolk and Lincolnshire, but also within Lincolnshire. As you can see, that as we move to Lincolnshire, uh, to, to Norfolk, we have sand dominated beds uh, in the center of the basin. Um, more or less the Skegness and um, uh, Spilsby area have mainly clay. But notice that there is also a fascist change to the north uh, towards the left of the diagram, where we have this limestone member, the Tealby limestone member, which we'll see more of later, uh, which is in the north, but fades out to the south in the center of the basin. Um, so there are fascist changes not only across the basin, but within the basin in Lincolnshire as well. So this is the part of, uh, that is mainly that is Lincolnshire based. Now, the lowest uh, beds of the East Lindsay group is the Spilsby sandstone. Uh, named, of course, after the town of Spilsby, which is more or less in the center of this basin. Uh, it's the lowest unit of the East Lindsay Group, and it straddles the Jurassic Cretaceous boundary. Exposures are limited, but I've put on this map um, several places where um, there are still Spilsby sandstone outcrops. Um, they are restricted in, um, in, in what they show, but at least they do show, provide snapshots, which we can put together to... Um, uh, to, to work out the um, stratigraphy of the Spilsby sandstone. The fullest section uh, of the uh, uh, Spilsby sandstone was recorded in a borehole by Swinton uh, many years ago uh, from a borehole at Fordington. Um, the maps, by the way, that occur at the top, usually at the top right of these slides, show you um, the locality that we're talking about. So Fordington is uh, the starred location on that map. So this is a, 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 a diagram that I produced based on the notes uh, um, written by um, Swinnerton. And I just put it into a diagram form. Um, so this is how he describes the, the strata in the um, recovered from the borehole at Fordington. And as you can see, a lot of... Um, um, sand, of course, it spills sandstone with nodules and pebble beds, ammonites towards the top end, um, clay beds, and in some parts the Spilsby sandstone is uh, cemented into a hard sandstone, and in others it's a, quite a soft sandstone and very friable. So it does vary across its, um, uh, or through its um, stratigraphy. Um, the mid Spilsby nodule bed whoops gone back i'm sorry the mid spills be sound, um, bed is mark is taken as the jurassic cretaceous boundary um and it's the equivalent it's been claimed of the coprolite bed of the speet and clay and possibly the cinder bed of Purbe. the photography um, 
Bail Ammonites was highlighted by Raymond Casey, uh, who unfortunately died in 2016. Uh, Raymond Casey began to re-examine Ammonites from the Spilsby Sandstone in 1962. Uh, Swinerton had attributed them to the Lower Cretaceous, but uh, Casey recognised Jurassic forms in the Lower Spilsby Sandstone, and it kick-started his research and interest while at the BGS uh, in defining Jurassic Cretaceous boundary and uh, probably uh, his association with Russia uh, and his love of stamp collecting from Russia too. Um, so he worked on these Ammonites um, both in Russia and in, in Lincolnshire. Uh, the Upper Spilsby Sandstone contains uh, very basic ammonites, which appear to show an evolutionary form uh, line um, from subcraspidites through an intermediate form to Volgidiscus. Um, and the lithology of the Spilsby Sandstone shown here is a quartz sandstone with lithic fragments. Uh, it has been suggested that they're derived from Scottish igneous and metamorphic rocks. Um, it has glauconite uh, with a calcite cement. In this particular case, it's quite strong, but often it's a very weak or, ab or it's absent. And it accounts for the variations that I was uh, mentioning in that uh, borehole section of uh, uh, Swinerton's. Um, because we do get variations when seen outcrop, sometimes very, very friable, other times a very hard, um, uh, a very hard building stone. Uh, this is um, a very, th this is, is interesting. This is a um, photograph of typical weathering of the Spilsby sandstone. Um, it weathers to this uh, pale gray green um coloration um in all places uh, at first you think it might be sort of algae or something but it's it is the way it weathers and this is the triple si site at harrington hall um which contains the middle uh, spills, uh, spills be, um pebble bed and therefore the junction between the cretaceous and the jurassic uh it's not very well um um kept at the moment um, I'm actually trying to um, get permission to clear it up a little bit with the Lincolnshire Geosites group, but uh, um, I might need some help by the looks of it. I was there um, in the autumn of this year, of last year, and it uh, it's even worse than it is in this photograph. And this is another site at Bully Hill Tealby. A little bit further north, and again, you can see this typical uh, weathering uh, from the brown to the very pale grey green um, coloration. This is, and uh, this this site, in fact, uh, just to go off piece a little bit, was the first um, site that the late um, Malcolm Fry and myself was asked to were asked to look at, and it had been recorded as Tealby limestone. And we both went into this little quarry and uh, immediately said, the record's wrong. This is Spilsby Sandstone. Um, <clears throat> so that was our first experience of the Spilsby Sandstone some years ago. So this is Bully Hill at Tealby. And there are other sites scattered around. Again, you can see this uh, color, typical coloration um, and so on. And variations in lithology and hardness. Uh, Hagworthingham has got a good section there. You can see... To, to two plus meters high, that uh, Hagworthingham section is um, a no-go area in the summer because uh, it's occupied by swifts that nest in there, uh, and uh, and martins. Uh, Summersby on the right there uh, has curious um, markings on. Some of them are, I suppose, rock art or so the people might call it graffiti. And it's also got um, uh, bee holes, the, the, the bees, the masonry bees that um, have drilled into it or whatever. So it's it's firm rock, but it's it's quite um, um, easy to, to get into. 
And then the Stenigot uh, section shows signs of burrowing. So there are signs of, of burrowing in the, in the Stenigot Spilsby sandstones. Uh, around Spilsby, um, the sandstone is sufficiently strong to form um, um, building stones. Um, some of the harder beds, certainly, around Spilsby and to the north of Spilsby. But it's restricted its distribution. Um, the dark blue triangles on this map uh, are the areas where I found uh, buildings uh, made from or built from the Spilsby sandstone. They tend to be from the lower Spilsby sandstone, the hard beds. Um, but you'll see that they're very restricted in their use. Um, they're, they're around areas where they found. They don't sort of um, use them widely across Lincolnshire, only very close to the source of them, uh, because there are better building stones. In, uh, in Lincolnshire, particularly the yellow, which is Lincolnshire limestone, which of course is taken um, to many parts of the country, let alone the county. Um, yeah. This is uh, Spilsby's church on the top left there, Spilsby itself, Bag Enderby and Market Stainton. Now, Bag Enderby is an interesting place. Um, I went to visit and take this photograph of the Bag End of Church and found one. It's very close to the Harrington Triple um, SI site as well. And uh, I, a voice from behind a hedge told me that it was much better um, a shot from behind his hedge in his garden than I the, the place I was standing. So I went across and he was right. And I took a photograph from the garden and he said, well, you must, are you on the Tennyson Trail? I said, no, I'm not actually. Oh, well, you must be on the Tolkien Trail then. And I said, no, I'm uh, in, in, looking at the geology. Oh, he said. And I said, what about what, what do you mean about Tolkien? And he said, well, he gets the name Bag End from Bag Enderby. Apparently, he'd stayed at Harrington Hall and um, was interested in the names of villages around this part of Lincolnshire. So Bag End, for those Hobbit fans, uh, gets its name from Bag Enderby, this little village in Lincolnshire. Okay, uh, Market Stainton Church, yes, and this is Tetford Church. Uh, and Tetford is a place that Malcolm and I visited very frequently. It's in Mid Lincolnshire, it's central to lots of things that we looked at, including chalk quarries as well. This is a close up, by the way, of little pebbles, like a little lag deposit in the Spilsby sandstone. And here you can see it's hard enough to be a good building stone. Um, Tetford has a pub opposite this, this church and uh, Malcolm and I rated it as the best ploughman's lunch in Lincolnshire. Now there's a lot of, um, because it is a, dis a very distinctive uh, rock, it has gone down in myth and legend in Lincolnshire. Um, this is the Winsby Stone, near a place called Winsby, a village called Winsby, and it's on the site of a battle, the Battle of Winsby, which is during the Civil War. It's a roadside block of hard sandstone with grooves or deep scratches. And the legend was that uh, underneath this stone, there lay buried treasure, uh, but that the devil kept perpetual guard on it. Um, now, the, the, the stone over years caused so much damage to farmers' plowshares that it was dug up and moved to the grass verge. Um, some believe that the deep scratches could be the claw marks of the devil. Others, that they're from the actions of the soldiers who used the stone to sharpen their swords uh, during the Civil War. But a third and more likely explanation is that they're the proof uh, of the damage suffered by the local farmers attempting to plow the field and they got so fed up of it they just dug it up and put it on the side of uh, side of the road so there's the the sign of uh, commemorating the battle of winsby 
1643. Uh, another um, uh, cr um, example of the um, Spilsby sandstones found above Caister. Uh, the photograph on the left was taken some time ago, as you can see from the photograph. Uh, this is a more recent photograph. It, this, this tree has grown over the top of it now, but here it is underneath. Um, and the Phonaby sack, uh, the story behind that is that St. Paulinus, who was a missionary in the 7th century, uh, was riding his ass along the ancient trackway above Caesa. And the ass was more obstinate than usual because it hadn't had any breakfast. And the saint saw a man up ahead who was sowing corn. Uh, he asked if he might share some of the grain. Uh, so he asked the man for some corn from the sack in the field. Oh, that's not a sack, replied the farmer. That's a stone. So the uh, St. Paulinus said, oh, it's a stone, is it? Then so shall it be. And so it was. And apparently it stayed in place in the field for many generations until one farmer decided to move it off his land. It was practically immovable and it took a whole team of horses to shift. After that, every misfortune imaginable fell on the farm. The farmer thought he'd better replace the stone and this time an old horse managed to drag it up the slope it's itself very easily. It's also said that uh, various other people who've damaged it have come to a sticky end, like one of the builders of the nearby Pelham's Pillar in the 1840s who chipped a bit off and then mysteriously fell from the pillar and was killed. Yep, myths. And the third one, the Devil's Pulpit. Again, you'll see the uh, distinctive weathering on this uh, standing out uh, lump of Spilsby sandstone. This is the devil's pulpit. And uh, apparently every night of the year, as the manor clock in the village of Tealby um, strikes the hour of midnight, the devil who inhabits the pulpit goes down to the nearby stream to drink. No one's ever seen him, of course, and nobody's heard the bell. But uh, there we go. Now, the top of the Spilsby sandstone is an eroded surface uh, representing the basal of Valanginian transgression. Uh, most of the upper Spilsby sandstone is absent north of Market Raisin. And it's succeeded uh, by the Claxby ironstone formation. So these are the contours on top of the uh, top surface of the Spilsby sandstone. And the, all the data uh, is taken from uh, BGS boreholes, uh, which are available online. So it's a, a matter of trawling through lots of borehole information um, and finding ones that are uh, um, appropriate and also reliable. So we can see this uh, uh, contours on the surface. And you'll notice that there is a postulated fault or structure because something funny happens along that line. Um, and it's also well known that just north of Caister is where the, the East Lindsay group feathers out and disappears. So this is the Claxby ironstone. This is a very weathered um, exposure near Caister, very close to the, uh, uh, about a mile probably, uh, south of where the East Lindsay group dies out, thins and, and disappears. Uh, and this is in a, a place called Water Hills, which is a, a place where several streams um, or several springs occur uh, in, into a, a little valley. Um, it's a, a goethite oolite clay ironstone, uh, and this much condensed um, sequence here at Water Hills uh, is because we're nearing the edge of this northern edge of the basin and up and, and moving towards the market Wheaton structure. So this is where we are. This is with um, the eastern side of this. Clickspe is the place where there is some sort of structure and it's the northern edge of the basin, re probably related to the market Wheaton structure. 
Um, Nettleton's a little bit further south. So that last slide was in this area here where my point is showing. Uh, Owen and Thurl, 1968, described beds to the south of Claxby as unctuous plastic clay uh, because there is a fascist change, which we'll still have a look. And uh, Casey, in 1973, introduced the term Hundleby clay as a fascist change from the Claxby ironstone as we move southwards out of the ironstone area into a more clay thing. And Rawson, Pete Rawson, gave formal status to this as the Hundleby member in 1992 and the Hundleby Clay member in 2006. So more of that in this slide here. Um, so this is fascist change between north and south. And again, I've traced it using borehole evidence from uh, the BGS um, site, online site. So we can see the class on fascies in the north. Now, the circles are the uh, relevant boreholes that have been used for this. And the figures alongside in black are thicknesses of, in meters that have recorded in each borehole. So, for instance, here we've got a borehole with four meters of Claxby ironstone. So you've got four there, 7.3, and so on. And then as we come further south, we've got one here at 2.8. When we get to Horncastle, you'll see that I've got 0 and 6.2. This one has 2.8 and 3.8. 2.8 of Claxby Einstone type rock, but 3.8 of this just plastic clay or Hundleby member of Rawson um, that's recorded. And this one at Horncastle has nothing of the... Claxby Einstein fasces type, but 6.2 metres of the Hundleby clay fasces. So I've drawn this sort of um, diagram here to show Hundleby clay fasces to the south and Claxby Einstein fasces to the north with this little transition zone where we get a bit of both. It's a pity there weren't some more um, boreholes available to... Um, uh, show this bit more clearly and more, more properly. Now, the best exposures of the Claxby Einstone occur in the scarp face of the Lincolnshire Wold south of Caister, between the villages of Nettleton and Claxby. Here's Nettleton in the north, Claxby in the south, here somewhere. Uh, both Nettleton village and Claxby village, however, are on Cambridge clay, uh, the, the Claxby gives its name to the ironstone in the hillside above it. Um, so this is just a map um, showing the Kimridge clay to the um, is to the to the west, the left here. This flat lying low land here is all Kimridge clay, um, and we've got uh, the, the Spilsby sandstone uh, yellow um, occurrences that are exposures of Spilsby sandstone shown in yellow. Here, above there, uh, Tealby limestone outcrops in blue, uh, and so on. And the Claxby ironstone outcrop is this red one here in the hillside, which we can trace up. Uh, a little bit of faulting goes on here and a poor exposure, but you can trace it across um, into the valley to the to the east. And um, one or two faults as well that we can map on as well. But so this is the area around Nettleton and Claxby uh, geological map. Yeah. Um, yeah. In the area one here, um, we've got the full sequence from the top of the Kimridge clay to the base of the Carstone. It's present in this steep hillside and uh, it's been my pleasure to have led groups containing no fewer than four former YGS presidents on field trips to this area of Area 1 here. Um, area 2 is um, Nettleton, Nettleton um, top, and Area 3 is Nettleton bottom, uh, all of which have exploited the iron ore 
in the past. So yes, here are your um, field trips with the uh, former YGS presidents. You might be able to spot, um, I think we've got two on one photograph here. We've got uh, our present president, Dr. Knight, um, Professor Peter Rawson, Andy Howard, Nick Riley. So, um, yep, we've all visited this Claxby site along with many others. Um, yeah. So, outcrops in the hillside uh, provide us with opportunities to examine the ironstone and its fauna, which consists of the uh, boreal belemnite acrotuthis, um, brachypods, and large bivalves such as Camptonectes kinctus. Uh, the boundary between the Spilsby sandstone and Claxby ironstone is easily located in places. We've got an obvious outcrop here of Claxby ironstone. Here we've got Spilsby sandstone block. Um, and so we put the boundary at this little um, change of slope here between the two. So we're standing on Claxby ironstone up here, looking at the fossils. And we've got a block of quite tough uh, Spilsby sandstone, probably from the lower Spilsby sandstone. The upper Spilsby sandstone not present at Claxby. And just a, a selection and assortment of Claxby ironstone fossils that have been collected from, uh, from Lincolnshire by John Green of Grimsby, to, who sent me these photographs, um, Endomoceros. Uh, the, the, this is uh, the um, bivalve, Camptes kinctus, and some uh, probably Acrotuthis. Um, Bellamnite here. So quite obviously a marine deposit. And this is the Camptonectes. And, and as you can see from the filling inside the shells, can you see the oolitic texture of these, um, of the sediment? The thing. And here, close up, you can see the oolite, the goethite oolite, um, sometimes referred to as gunshot texture. In all three areas um, uh, on the, shown on the map, the Claxby ironstone has been extracted for use in the iron and steel industry. Initially from Claxby uh, area, mine area one, uh, and the ore was sent to ironworks of the West Yorkshire Iron and Coal Company at Ardsley near Leeds. Uh, the Nettleton areas, areas two and three, uh, the ores were sent to Scunthorpe to supplement uh, the Frodingham ironstone uh, Jurassic ore from 1944 until closure of the mines in 1968. So Claxby was the first uh, mining operation area, uh, followed by areas two and three at Nettleton. These are some ore production uh, figures. This is Claxby mine, which you can see. Uh, 1868 was when it opened, the peak there, um, and then it declined and eventually closed 1885. Apparently, the working conditions were absolutely atrocious. Um, many deaths um, and so on. Um, these are the Metalton Mines ironstone production from 1934. Um, as you can see, a little bit of a, a dip there just uh, during the war years, Second World War peak in the 1960s uh, and then a, a very sharp decline um, between a peak in 1967 and 1969 or so, 1968. Um, older BGS employees may be familiar with uh, Vernon Wilson, uh, who led the investigation uh, borehole investigation um, for reserves of the Claxby ironstone during the Second World War. Um, so he was um, very busy uh, in the Scunthorpe and Claxby areas uh, looking at ore reserves. And uh, I once went to visit the North Lincolnshire Museum reserves uh, collection and uh, 
there were some framed photographs in there and I spotted one of Vernon Wilson and it hadn't been labelled and the curator didn't know who it was. So I was able to to um, to tell them who it was. Vernon um, Wilson uh, interviewed me uh, when I went for an interview for BGS way back in 1966, I think it was. Yeah. Uh, changes to the industry um, are shown in the, some photographs here. This is the um, um, Claxby um, workers on the left here in 1929. And then by 1959, we've got more mechanisation. This is Nettleton and leading ore from the mines, the addits um, for shipment to Scunthorpe. And this photograph from 1968 is the last shift at Nettleton. Um, <clears throat> there are, of course, three, uh, three ironstone ore bodies in Lincolnshire. The Claxby ironstone, which is part of the East, Mid uh, East uh, Lindsay Group, the Northampton Sand ironstone, and the Frodingham ironstone. Uh, there's still evidence of the iron ore mining activities in the area. Um, obviously, they're accessible for viewing. Uh, the adits, obviously, they're all boarded off. Um, wouldn't uh, suggest anybody goes inside them. You can see the um, Claxby ironstone here above this um, adit. So the adit going straight into the Claxby ironstone hillside here. Now this is the, these are the old stables. Uh, for, for the pit ponies or the ponies that pulled the wagons through the valley or through the tunnel uh, to get to the railhead for shipment to Scunthorpe from Nettleton Bottom to the railhead. Um, and this can still be visited. And I think they've got the names of the ponies still um, on there. This is at Nettleton Top. Uh, now, Stuart Squires... Um, has done a lot of research. Stuart is with the Society for Lincolnshire History and Archaeology. And over several years, um, he's done a lot of research and has reconstructed this hillside at Claxby, showing some of the industrial archaeology um, with the adits here in the hillside and the drift mine, and then the slope down to the place where they all was put into trucks and then led down to the railway line along this incline. And there's still evidence, scraps of evidence um, for this industry in the hillside. You can, you can still see evidence of the industrial archaeology in the hillside here. Now, the Spilsby sandstone, uh, sorry, the uh, Claxby ironstone, as well as an ore, um, is also be used as a building stone. It's not the best building stone, uh, but it is used because it is. There was plenty of it, and it was available. And uh, this is Saint John the Baptist Church in Nettleton, and as we can see, we can see um, pieces of large bivalves in in Summerby Church, uh, and uh, similarly in Saint Mary's at Claxby itself. So plenty of iron ore. Or Claxby or available as a building stone too. So particularly in the villages of Nettleton and Claxby. Uh, Summerby Church is something of a surprise. It's a few kilometres north uh, from the northern limit of the outcrop. But obviously someone um, took the bothered and the to get it there. So presumably a landowner who had a Claxby ironstone pit or something. Now a spring line um, defines the boundary of the Lower Tealby Clay, and which is the next bed up, and where present the overlying Tealby limestone. Um, this is a case in the in Caister, in Fountains Lane, Cipher Spring Caister. This is the base of the Tealby limestone, um, where it meets the Lower Tealby Clay. And it, in it, another example is at a place called Normanbilly Wold, 
And here again, a spring issues, the base of the Tealby limestone um, at the junction with the lower Tealby clay, which sits on top of the Claxby ironstone. Uh, and this has been utilized for watering cattle. The stream that issues, or the stream that forms from the overflow or the outflow, uh, is where the photograph is taken from, is where the spring was, and it leads down into a little valley. And in the sides of this valley, we can recognize um, outcrops of the lower Tealby clay. So it's forming the base of the floor of this valley that leads down towards Laxby. And this is just a close up of the Tealby clay that I collected from that valley. And notice the goethite oolites, even in the clay here, we can still see these little um, iron rich ooliths within here. Uh, the scale bar 10 millimeters, by the way, so it's um, highly, highly magnified. It's a dried sample. Now, the Tealby clay above that spring uh, crops out. This is a, an example of the Tealby limestone. It crops out in the fields above the spring, and there are records of the ammonite Symboscites, um, it, which allows crude correlation with the Speton clay C or lower bee beds. So that's more or less an equivalent um, sort of um, coeval beds, the speed and clay C or lower B. Um, again, this is a close up of the um, um, Tealby limestone. And again, note the iron uh, coated grains in the limestone, which sometimes give the, the rock a brownish tinge. Uh, the, now at Normanby, there are adjacent um, outcrops. St. Peter's House is more or less where the section with the spring uh, is. And Normanby Lodge is the opposite side of the road. And there's a correlation between two um, sections. So we can see the Tealby limestone uh, can be correlated across um, there. It just thins in places there. So the Tealby limestone outcrops there. Uh, the unfortunate thing in this area is because of uh, a lot of uh, human activity during the uh, at, um, Claxby Einstone extraction and the nature of the beds, there's a lot of land slipping. Um, and uh, so quite often things that you think are in situ are actually uh, slipped. So you've got to be very careful about correlation between sites. And this is back to um, that uh, site at Caister, which I mentioned earlier with the Claxby Ironstone. This is Water Hills again. Um, and I did mention that we're getting towards the northern edge of the uh, basin, and therefore we're getting a very condensed sequence. And in this particular one, we've got fallen blocks of Tealby limestone from here, this ledge of Tealby limestone, um, which is above the... Uh, Spilsby sandstone and Claxby ironstone and then we've even got the red chalk up here so within this one little section here we've got almost the whole of the East Lindsay group um, beds the, almost the, the whole of this group I'm, I'm focusing on in this talk in this one section um, so just back to this map of Claxby again, just to show you uh, where we are with this. Um, just note in um, area one here uh, that during a visit um, in uh, a YGS visit, in fact, in 2021, this is walking, by the way, um, along the Tealby limestone outcrop, but we did... Um, note a new excavation that had been made by the landowner um, outcrops of the uh, Tealby limestone are, seem to be few and far between there's quite a lot of buildings made of Tealby limestone but where they got the uh, rock from is a mystery um, because there aren't many quarries of Tealby limestone but uh, this landowner has had made an, um, a new ex uh, excavation um, he was trying to provide a ready supply of water for his cattle. 
Um, so there's exposed TLB limestone with, I believe, a good possibility of the lower TLB clay. And uh, I plan to revisit this site in the near future to measure and collect after it's had a period of weathering. Um, so uh, that's something that is still to be done. It should, uh, should provide a good section through the limestone and the lower TLB clay beneath. Uh, there was one block of TLB limestone that we came across which was very interesting. It showed evidence of burrowing akin to thalassinoides. You can just see the burrows on this uh, block here of TLB limestone. Uh, it's also seen um, being used uh, in um, the Claxby mine iron workings that uh, Stuart Squires has mapped. Um, it's a retaining wall uh, on the east side of the former siding that the wagons were pulled into for loading with the with the ore. Um, so this is Tealby limestone, but it's capped here with Spilsby sandstone. Okay, um, as a building stone, then the uh, the Tealby limestone, which are the blue symbol, these blue symbol, mid blue here triangles and squares um, it's found as the as the Spilsby sandstone is it's found very close to uh, its 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 outcrop uh, it doesn't sort of doesn't isn't not carried very far away from where it crops out um, there is one anomalous uh, occurrence however away from the outcrop of the Tealby limestone up here um, and I, it made me wonder why it was uh, used up here. And then I realized, of course, it's very close to the route of a Roman road. So transport would have been quite easy. Um, and I've also found it in places when I've been asked by uh, archaeologists from the University of Cambridge to have a look at some, uh, sorry, University of Canterbury, to have a look at some uh, material in a site that they were excavating. And we found Tealby limestone up there. Uh, so certainly um, the Romans uh, either used it themselves or they provided the route way for later people to transport it. But although it's widely used in Caister and villages to the south, um, it, there's little evidence the remains of sites from which the rock was extracted, as I mentioned earlier. I do know of one that is now the back garden of a house in Caister, um, but not easily visited. Uh, here are some blocks of, uh, of the limestone in Caister, uh, probably from the church. You can see Bellum Knights sections, um, bits of a large bivalve again, uh, but lots of Bellum Knights uh, in this stuff. Yeah, those are the numbers, and uh, I put in, well, yeah, what did the Romans ever do for us? The records of the Tealby limestone uh, disappear um, south of a line drawn from Scamblesby in the southwest and Louth in the northeast. Um, so it's another example of Fasci's variation. So, yeah, south of there, the Tealby limestone disappears and um, becomes uh, more clay. So uh, this is again taken from Bohol um, information uh, from the BGS records. Um, it thins southwards from the type of, these are thicknesses of the Tealby limestone. And as you can see, uh, it's getting thinner and thinner and thinner as we go towards Louth and then nothing here. Uh, so we can put a boundary on more or less tentatively to show where the extent of the um, Tealby limestone is. So it's very thin there in Louth itself. And the whole of the Tealby formation of Lincoln is replaced by the Aranaceous Dersingham formation of Norfolk further down, as we'll see a little bit later. So um, this is another example of this fascist variation within the East Lindsay group within Lincolnshire. 
And this is a, a, sec, a, a section taken from uh, Ray Galois' unpublished doctoral thesis, 1983, which perhaps shows you what happens to the um, uh, Tealby limestone as it goes moves southwards there. It becomes, um, disappears completely by um, South Lincolnshire and into Norfolk. It, it's a dark grey shelly clay probably in the Skegness borehole and then thins out completely. Uh, that's the Hundleby clay uh, that we mentioned earlier, the, the um, Fasci's variation from the uh, Claxby Einstone. So here we go. These are the Tealby limestone member. And as we get to the south, Skegness borehole, it's changed completely. It's, but it's still a Tealby formation, but it's not a limestone anymore. And then as we move into Norfolk, and the, it's com completely replaced by an Arenaceous um, sequence, the Dersingham, these eight members, and so on. Now back to um, Normanby with the Wold. Uh, above that Tealby limestone outcrop, that this is the spring that I mentioned a bit earlier with that valley running down into the lower Tealby clay from which I collect the clay specimens. This is that spring for the uh, animals. Above the Tealby limestone, there is uh, outcrops of this sand, sometimes hardened into blocks here and for, very ferruginous, in fact, richer in iron than the Claxby ironstone and uh, the Frodingham ironstone, actually, uh, but it's not reliable. And this is the roach, or has been called the roach. It's, uh, as I said, a red iron-rich sand with clays um, belonging to the Baremian roach formation. Uh, Owen and Thrull in 1968 believed these beds to be anomalous ferruginal fa ferruginous fasces of the upper Tealby clay. Um, there's a roach. Um, this is the section in this sequence here. Um, at Normanby Lodge, Roach Einstone, above the Tealby limestone. Higher up still, there is a dark green clay. Uh, this is a close-up of the roach. Uh, it contains these characteristic pods of, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> uh, characteristic pods of iron-rich sand uh, bounded by these ferruginous crusts. Uh, and this is typical, and it, and it breaks up into, into very blocky, um, and, and sometimes friable with blocks in, blocks of ferruginous sand in. Um, further south, uh, though catalogued as a monument uh, by uh, Lincolnshire Heritage, Ho Hill is completely, oh, sorry, uh, is completely natural. Um, it's Teal Tealby formation capped with um, an outcrop of roach which is sometimes referred to by its now obsolete term, the Fullerby beds. Uh, it forms an elongated ridge-shaped outlier. And on a very fine day from this point, it's possible to make out the North Norfolk coast uh, from the high spots. Um, but this is an outcrop of the Fullerby beds, or the Roach, on top of the Tilby formation, Ho Hill. Quite an outstanding feature uh, in this part of Lincolnshire. Now, there's still much work to be done on clarifying the stratigraphy of the Roach Formation, uh, as it's now recognised. Uh, Swinnerton Kent in 1981 edition of the Geology of Lincolnshire make no mention whatsoever of the Roach. Um, the BGS map uh, map everything between Tealby limestone and Carstone as Upper Tealby clay. Uh, that's on their Kingston upon Hull and Brig sheets. Um, whereas Owen and Thurl believe that the roach of South Lincolnshire may be younger than similar beds referred to as roach in the north of the county. Uh, so there's a lot of work still to be done on uh, the roach formation. Um, reliable interpretation of borehole records uh, may be the key to correlation, as exposures are few and far between. Uh, a start's been made in the south of the county. Uh, by Galwa, 1983, uh, but use of BGS records must be treated with care. Uh, many records may not distinguish between carstone and roach. Indeed, there is a record of carstone 
being described from the summit of Ho Hill, the uh, monument in inverted commas that we saw just a bit earlier. So uh, you've got to be very careful. Now the topmost beds of the East Lindsay group, uh, which are the Skegness Clay and Sutterby Mall, are known from borehole records, but not always recognised, and from a few sections. Um, so it's this part of the column here. Um, Swinnerton's 1935 type section of the Sutterby Mall, uh, which is shaded in brown on this diagram here, um, <clears throat> It was from a trench at Sutterby, and it showed 80 centimetres of pale grey and yellow clays uh, with a basal phosphatic pebble bed. Uh, ammonites of lower Aptian age were recovered, but Case's later work showed that these were derived from three zones of the lower Aptian uh, and suggested an up to Aptian age. Uh, Ray Galois' work on the core from the Skegness borehole uh, in 1975, proved two metres of dark grey clays beneath the Sutterby Mall and separated by a phosphatic nodule bed, which was proposed as the top boundary of the Skegness clay. Um, he believes that Swinnerton was unfortunate in choosing a site where the Sutterby Mall has cut out the underlying Skegness clay. Now, an example of possible lack of recognition is shown in a comparison of the logs from three boreholes, um, two close to the coast north of Skegness, um, and the other from a site close to Sutterby itself. So is this a thickened Sutterby Marl on the left at Brink Hill, uh, which is preserved in a hollow beneath the carstone, or could it include the Skegness clay? So it's the interpretation of the borehole um, uh, and so on. So it uh, needs more research into what we've got here. So is this really that thick or does it incorporate uh, something else? Um, and the Skegness clay uh, contains a lower Aptian fauna. Uh, including the earliest appearance of Prodeitis. And the indigenous faunal assemblage is representative of the Bodii subzone, and the upper bee beds at Speeton are the only British examples. Um, derived faunas have been recorded at the base of the Atherfield clay, Woburn sands at Potton, the lower green sand at Upware, and the Carstone at Hunstanton. And the base of the Skegness clay is proposed by Galois as the Bohemian Aptian boundary. Here. Now, an overview of comparisons with other early Cretaceous centres of deposition, uh, particularly to the north at Speton and in southeast England, is necessary to piece together the paleogeography uh, of the times. So, this is a section perhaps familiar to many. Uh, this is a view of speet and clay, which has long been the focus of attention for individual researchers and groups, such as the whole based friends of the speet and clay. And the upside down allocation of bed labels, D for instance, being older than C and B, can be attributed to Lamplu, who worked, and as I mentioned in my first presidential address in 2019, uh, Lamplu worked from Bridlington to Filey Bay, um, from south to north, around Flamborough Head, and thus down the stratigraphic column. Um, many field trips um, to Speton have been organised, notably by um, the Hull Geological Society and the YGS, but in this case uh, by the GA, and led by and circled a young Peter Rawson, some of you may recognize him. And this again with Peter, again with that same, probably the same um, uh, field trip and some pretty famous 
uh, geologists to, I think this is Kakoldi. I may be, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, thank you to Jonathan Larwood uh, for supplying these uh, last two images uh, from the GA archive. Uh, you can see perhaps why I put these two in, because it was originally meant for my, for, 90, uh, for 2020, uh, at which I expected Peter to be present. And I put these in as a bit of a surprise for him. Um, and Peter still continues to lead field trips to Speton, um, sharing his knowledge uh, and in his retirement to Scarborough. So Peter on the left here uh, at his beloved Speton clay at Speton below the Red Chalk. Now, a correlation is possible between the Speet and Clay and the East Lindsay group using a log from a North Sea borehole. Uh, both sequences are marine, with evidence for both Tethian and boreal faunas. And note that the borehole sequence does not include the highest beds, the upper B beds of the Speet and Clay and the Skegness Clay Sutterby Marl of the East Lindsay group. But here you can see I've shaded in colour the Speet and Clay with its equivalents from the East Lindsay group. So the yellow overshaded bits, um, D beds, <clears throat> uh, in part at least, are the Spilsby sandstone formation. The rest of the D beds and into the C beds are the Claxby ironstone formation equivalent. And the Tealby formation from lower C beds up to, uh, well, all the way through the C beds, the rest of the C beds really. And then the Roach formation taking over uh, at the top here, the lower bee beds. So that's the um, correlation between East Lindsay Group and the Speeton clay. Now to Southeast England, where we got a different story completely. Uh, in Southeast England, Topley was tasked with writing the account of the geological surveys, mapping and interpretation of the geology of the Weald. A <coughs> hundred years after its publication, would take us to 1968 and it was a celebration of this event that was the subject of my first attendance at a public lecture when I visited uh, the GA in Burlington House. Um, an attempt at time correlation between the East Lindsay group and the basins of southern England is shown in this diagram. Again I've used the colours that I've used before to show the correlation here. So the Spilsby sandstone equivalent here, Claxby ironstone, the Wessex formation, Tealby formation, Roach formation. And then in this case, we've got the Skegness clay and the Sutterby Marl equivalents here in the lower greensand groups. Um, and this is simplified from Gale and Woodcock. Uh, Percy Allen was a leader in proposing models for the paleogeography of uh, the Wealden, of the Weald, even including two groups of grazing iguanodons. You, see, you see them circle here in, uh, in these delta lands. Um, three at West Hoathly and two at Breed. Here's Breed and here's West Hoathly. Okay, linking the two basins together then. Um, oh, the basins of deposition through early Cretaceous. This is the equivalent of the Spilsby sandstone. We can see the deeper water of the Cleveland Basin, um, the shallower uh, fasces in the East uh, Midlands Shelf, uh, the Spilsby sand, the, sorry, the um, East Lindsay Group. And then this probable marine overspill, that ephemeral one, into the scattered lakes here, uh, draining from the northwest, and then the Wessex Basin and the south here. So this is probably uh, the picture during the Spilsby sandstone formation. And what was happening in the Spilsby sandstone? Probably um, in Lincolnshire, the Spilsby sandstone was probably deposited as a coastal sand spread uh, with the shoreline not too far away. Uh, tidal channels would have been filled and rivers would bring sediment from metamorphic provinces akin to the Scottish Highlands. Ingham in 1929 in the, in the proceedings of the Yorkshire Jolsock uh, described the petrology or petrography rather of the um, Spilsby sandstone and uh, 
suggested this derivation from the Scottish Highlands. Um, Gaunt in the BGS and Hull Brig memoir suggested that some of the sediment would have been brought into the region by longshore drift. And so tidal lagoons formed probably behind sandbars, uh, giving rise to high organic activity and precipitation of phosphates and glauconite. And by the mid Houterivian, uh, there were open marine conditions. So these are just two possible models for the Spilsby sandstone, an almost enclosed basin, uh, gradually filling with sediment with tidal channels and some sediment coming in uh, via this tidal delta from longshore drift. And then as well, this uh, model B, a lagoon behind sand barriers backed by tidal flats and creeks and sediment from land by rivers and from the sea in pulses through this tidal delta. So um, two possible models there for the Spilsby sandstone. Um, by the mid Houterivian, open marine conditions with ready access for both boreal and Tethian faunas prevailed with ironstone and marine clays dominating in the north. Uh, conditions wouldn't have been conducive to iron precipitation, so it's likely that the iron content of the Claxby ironstone and Tealby formation is from marginal lagoons, uh, destroyed during the marine transgression. So you can see this gradual um, deepening of the water from the Cleveland Basin into the area with the sand dominant uh, towards um, East Anglia. Uh, this uh, slide is of the situation proposed for the Aptian, that's uh, the Skegness Clay and Sutterby Mall, and the transgression seems to have been completed, uh, though disconformities previously mentioned may point to some periodic uh, instability. Uh, and again, this link, probably the Bedfordshire Straits linking the two basins together, uh, with a very ephemeral sort of link between the two. So I leave you with a view looking westwards from the chalk uh, scarp at Red Hill Triple SI, uh, which is a red chalk um, exposure over what is arguably Lincoln's most, Lincolnshire's most scenic countryside and all founded on rocks of the East Lindsay Group. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Paul. Thanks so much, uh, Paul. Yeah. Thought, Paul. James is going to moderate the questions. Yes, okay. I've already had a question in the chat. Um, Can you just give me five minutes? Just, well, two minutes. I'll be back very, very shortly. Yep. Yeah, of course, Paul. I need a comfort break. <laughs> in the meantime, if anybody has any questions, please put them in the Q&A for Paul Trance when he comes back. Uh, up up to that point, just a kind of a couple of commercials to well put uh, as in this, in this commercial break. So, reminding those of you who have yet to sign up and still want to go for a trip to Newcastle, this Saturday is the uh, the meeting at Northumbria University. It begins at one o'clock in the afternoon, um, and in Newcastle, and it's on new developments in the understanding of the geology of Northern England. I know we've already got a very good sign up for it, but. Um, for those of you who still want to do, you can sign up on the web on, on the website, uh, or you can uh, just turn up on the day. So that's at Northumbria University uh, this Saturday, and then the next webinar after that is uh, on April the seventh, April the tenth, sorry, at seven p.m. April the tenth at seven p.m. Uh, and David Leather's going to give us a great talk about the uh, uh, the Great Orcadian Lake in Westray. Uh, I've seen some of the material in the slides. It looks a really super talk, and those of you who are interested in the Orcadian Lake and its evolution and history, please feel free to sign up for that and join us for the webinar, the next one, which is April the 10th. I will now hand back over to Paul and, uh, you. Sorry and James with the commercial break finished. Thank you, Thank Mike. You. Right, so first question then, Paul. Yeah. How does Claxby... Yeah, sorry, let me say again. How does Claxby Einstone compare with Cleveland Einstone? Example, constituents and siderite. Right. Um, okay. Claxby Einstone. Yeah. Uh, the, I mean, the, the Cleveland Einstone, petrologically, is, is more similar to the Frodingham Einstone, isn't it? With uh, berthurine 
Um, I think both are in contact, whereas the Claxby is go go tight. Um, uh, and of course, I'm to, I'm, I presume the, the questioner is asking about the lithology, is it, or the petrography of it, not the age. Uh, it doesn't specify, so if you can go into both. Yeah, because uh, obviously the Claxby ironstone is, is early Cretaceous, the Cleveland ironstone is lower Jurassic. Um, so big difference in time, um, more more akin in time with the Frodingham ironstone, but not exactly directly equivalent. Um, but the Claxby ironstone, yeah, is, is a very different beast. Yeah, both both mineralogically and uh, and and and, and time wise. I hope that answers the question. If that's what the thank you, that Paul. Um... If you if you guys can put questions into the chat, if that's again as two have raised their hand. Um, let me make sure the chat is open to everybody before I say that. Yes. Yep. So, if, any more questions from anybody? Ah. Uh, that's just a comment. Um, okay. Is that sure. it for questions? I don't think we've got any more popping in. Oh. It's okay about oh, me. Well, he says they've got chat disabled. Um, allow me to rectify that. Okay, should allow everyone to comment now. Apologies, I can see where that was an issue. We lost you, Paul. Two minutes to type. I can see a couple of raised their hand rather than asking in the chat, so I'll just allow them okay. to talk in case they want to ask a question. So I'll start with Adrian. Adrian, you're muted. Adrian, can you hear us? If you can just click unmute. That's it. I was just uh, commenting earlier that we uh, were having difficulty seeing the slides. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. actually, from the, from, that. the, from the beginning uh, that we sorted. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. It was sorted, and thanks to Mike for the comment. <laughs> okay. In that case, the other hand that went up, um, and I'm assuming that's for now, is from John, and I'll allow him to talk as well. Hi, John, do you have a question, Zolf Paul? You've muted yourself again, John. You're muted, John, so we can't hear you if you ask. Can you hear me now, Paul? Yes, John. Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Yeah, basically, uh, it was a bit of a, a, foreign, a foreigner question. Uh, yes, I understand uh, the answer to your question. Basically, the uh, Claxby Ironstone Formation yes. is very similar in lithology uh, to the Cleveland Ironstone Formation, namely... Uh, the constituents of the uh, Cleveland limestone basically are uh, siderite and uh, iron oxide, and uh, basically uh, very similar to the Claxby ironstone. Okay. Or is there any fundamental difference between? the uh, Claxby ironstone and for, uh, formation and the Cleveland ironstone formation. The Cleveland ironstone formation basically consists of uh, siderite, 
uh, as well as um, um, ironstone, oolites, uh, oolitic ironstone. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, in, in that case, then, yeah, mineralogically, probably, possibly quite similar. Um, uh, I don't think it's as, I don't think the Clapsk ironstone is as rich as the Cleveland ironstone, um, though I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, um, and it, it doesn't, it doesn't appear when you, when you see uh, examples of it to be as, as dense as the Cleveland ironstone, as compacted. Um, right, and I, and I think there's probably a higher clay content because it sometimes is is quite as you saw from that section at Water Hills, it soon yeah. it soon um, disintegrates into a clay mess. Right. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think there's probably a higher clay content in the Claxbury stuff. I mean, right. But it was right. it was rich enough to be of use for a while at least. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you very much. Uh... Yeah, thank you very oh, much it's indeed. Pleasure. It's a pleasure, John. Thank you. A fascinating talk. Uh, I tend to concentrate on Cleveland as opposed to uh, Lincolnshire. Uh, I, I must pay a visit more often to Lincolnshire. Well, it's worth a visit. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. All right, we have a few more um, questions sure. in the um, Q&A bit. Okay. So we have a question from a Paul Robinson, a former native of Waddington, who asks, will you publish in the magazine? What, in PYGS, do you mean? I'm assuming so, but it doesn't quite say uh, which if, one. If Paul um, can publish which one, that'd be fantastic. Quite willing to do so, uh, if I'm asked. <laughs> uh, it's, it, it, I mean, it is, it is quite um, traditional for the President's Address to be published. Uh, or to be written up, um, but I think there is a backlog, Doctor Knight, isn't there? Another thing to add as well with Paul, um, he's asked a second question. Uh, sorry, uh, I'll just sorry to uh, to go on um, with that question, uh, James, yeah. about publishing it. Um, I did mention Malcolm Fry in my talk uh, that I dedicated the talk to him. Um, shortly before Malcolm died and after we started working on this, we were both at the Lincolnshire show with a stall from the Lincolnshire Geoconservation Group um, showing rocks of Lincolnshire. And uh, we happened to come across a copy of Swinnerton and Kent, the, Ge the Geology of Lincolnshire book. And uh, I was asked by the stallholder, did I want to buy a copy? <laughs> and I said, well, quite honestly, no. It's so out of date. Uh, you've still got things in feet and inches, and you're using old terminology. And he, he said to Malcolm and myself, well, could you two rewrite it? And we said, foolishly, perhaps, yes. So we did start, but within three or four months of starting, Malcolm died. So I am rewriting it at the moment. So this will form part of one chapter of uh, the rewrite of the book, Swinnerton and Kent. Yeah. So, but I, but I might write this up as, um, yeah, as a pres presidential address for PYGS. I think that answers Paul's second question as well. So I'm going to move on to Mary Howard's question, um, which is, Whereabouts are the anomalous TLB limestone building stones found? Um, okay. Hi, Mary. Roman roads. Uh, Mary, they're at uh, Irby on Humber. Um, in the church at Irby on Humber, which is just uh, east of, of Laceby. Um, and the excavations that I went to see um, for the, the archaeological site, there was one at Bealsby and another one at Binbrook. So for people who live in Lincolnshire, they know where those places are. Mary does. So, she, yeah, she'll know where they are. Fantastic. So moving on to the next question then from Paul Thornley. Um, he's saying that the Spilsby sandstone looks similar to the Cretaceous grit. Is Spilsby calcareous? 
It is in part, yes, definitely. Other parts, not so much. But yes, you can get a fizz with uh, dilute hydrochloric acid on so, on some spe specimens of, of 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 it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's very heavily cemented in some places. Very well cemented with calcite in others. Yeah. Uh, Mike Horn's question is next. Ah, is right. Hi, Mike. A rifle butt, the triple S I site. There are geophyte. Yeah, sorry, mispronunciation there. Geophyte oolifs included in the base of the red chalk formation. Could there be a relationship with the ELG? Could well be. Yeah, in the red chalk, it's yes, the red chalk. Unless they're of course they're derived. Uh, because at rifle butts, of course, the red chalk sits directly on the lias. All the Lower Cretaceous has been chopped, well, apart from the red chalk, has been chopped out. I don't think there's even any carstone at uh, Rifle Butts. I think the red chalk is directly on the on the lias. So all the Middle Jurassic, Upper Jurassic has been cut out by the Market Wheaton structure. Yeah, so it, yeah, it could be that it's derived, but the lower part of the chalk, yeah, the lower part of the red chalk. I would have thought different conditions, though, of deposition. So more derived than since, sin, yeah, sin deformation, uh, sin uh, depositional. Right. Well, I believe that is the end of the questions looking there. So thank you, Paul, for answering those. I'm going to pass this okay. on to Mike now to um, end the webinar. Yeah. Okay. So, thank you. Many thanks, Paul. Uh, I was really looking forward to this because it took me back to my school days. Uh, going up and down the, the hillsides around Claxby and Nettleton, uh, looking at the ironstone. It was one of the first outcrops I ever visited when I was doing my A-level geology. So uh, it takes me back the 10 years or so to uh, to when I was a schoolboy. Uh, <laughs> um, but no, it's super tall. I mean, this is great because the, these outcrops are so poorly exposed yeah. and so difficult yeah. to find. It's great to have such a story from somebody who's seen and knows all of them. Uh, and links it in with the, the all the BGS and the old IGS boreholes. Uh, super little anecdotes as well of those who've worked in the geology of the area, uh, and also the pubs to visit and the uh, uh, and the best lunches um, and the historical anecdotes and the industrial archaeology. So it was a lovely kind of altogether holistic talk, Paul. And many many thanks, uh, much appreciated. And it was a super webinar. Uh, so thanks so much. Take care, and thanks Thank all you, of Paul. you. Don't forget about the webinar next one in April and on Saturday at Northumbria, uh, the new developments in the understanding of the geology of northern eastern England. Thank you very much for everybody for joining us. Thank you, everybody. Cheers. Do you want to hang in there, Paul? We can chat I'm about hanging, yours. I'm hanging in. Yeah, I'm hanging in there. I don't know if John wants to as well.